Hi, welcome to Literaturely, a podcast about teaching literature. I'm Margaret Moth. And I'm Paige Wallace. In season two. Yeah, welcome to season two. (laughs) I'm excited to record again, get back into the swing of things and chat with you about teaching. Yeah, me too. It's been a weird year for teaching. It's like been more and more the fantasy and dreams of like future classes been like get, has been getting me through things absolutely yeah and like this podcast has been the perfect platform of just being like there'll be a better day it's coming. <laughs> yeah we're yeah. gonna Which, get to teach online forever <laughs> yeah one day we'll be able to see our students faces again yeah. we'll know yeah. what they look like <sighs> okay yeah. but that's, that's kind of like a good segue in terms of like thinking about the future that I think in what we were talking about with teaching a class in civil rights, because that's what we're talking about today is uh, Mm -hmm. teaching civil rights literature or literature of the civil rights. It sounds like we were both interested in the way civil rights literature doesn't just reflect the past, but looks to a brighter future. Yeah, I think you're right. And so we were specifically talking about how when we examine civil rights literature, we can think about history as a kind of translation and that's malleable, right? Like it is not, uh, there's never one version. And a lot of times when we have students, um, when we introduce this material with students, they've gotten a really sanitized version. And I think that I got a sanitized version, especially growing up in South Carolina for much of my education when it comes to learning about when it came to learning about civil rights. Yeah, I struggle to remember with this sort of stuff because the Scholastic Book Fair, (laughs) like I got a lot of civil rights books for whatever reason. And so sometimes I can't remember what I was reading on my own and what I was reading for school. Yeah. But now my brain is all of a sudden, oh my gosh, Paige, I don't know if I've told you this, that like in fifth or sixth grade, in our English class, we had to write a report on a civil rights figure, like where that's where they were teaching us how to write these sorts mm-hmm. of essays. And they gave us a list of names because we were 10, you know? And I was one of the last people to pick. So, you know, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, they'd already been taken. And so I picked Nat Turner. Okay. And I just think about my all girls Catholic school, including Nat Turner on this list. <laughs> <laughs> and 10 year old me going to the library and be like, I need all of your books on Nat Turner. I have a report. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I honestly, I do think that that has shaped my understanding of civil rights movement where I'm like, sometimes you have to have a rebellion. <laughs> He's not exactly um, the go to figure. Mm-hmm. for discussing and obviously he's not part of the civil rights movement but well you know what I was just thinking about that we didn't talk about beforehand so I'm gonna like kind of throw this in is that a lot of like a lot of the texts that I think about when I first think about civil rights are things that I read when I was younger yeah and so like even like this class could be a really interesting children's literature class right so how do you push past sanitized versions of Martin Luther King, of Rosa Parks, to kids that are 10 years old? And that's an interesting question because there has to be some balance, right? Because you are talking to children who you want to shield in certain ways, but also need to have some version that goes beyond, like touches on the complexity of these people, the movement, the fact that it's still like a living, breathing movement today and not just a story of the past. I think that there's always a lot of conversation about the way that Rosa Parks is portrayed to our kids, right? Because that's something we don't need to sanitize. We could talk about her as the woman that she is and not portray her as like a little old lady who just happened to sit down. Yeah, that Um, passive, like, yeah, not rebellious, just tired. Yeah, and so, like, this could be a really interesting children's literature class. Yeah. Uh, for, for teaching future teachers how uh, to approach, you know, the nuances of this genre or this topic in a way that's accessible to, to stu- like, young students. So yeah. You learn that rebellion is necessary sometimes. Um, well, that's what I was thinking. Like, we don't have a problem with teaching the Revolutionary War. You right. know? Like... <laughs> 
we don't straight away like they dumped things into the harbor <laughs> or they tarred and feathered people like I remember like in fourth fifth sixth grade we talked about the violence of the revolutionary war like we talked about how they tarred and feathered people like I remember reading a YA novel for class about a girl who's the novel starts with her dad being tarred and feathered well, and like we, and I think that we don't stray away from violence in general, right? We talk about the violence of slavery, um, at least to a certain extent. And it's almost like we're willing to talk about violence, but we're not always willing to talk about the necessity of rebellion. The school I went to was like particular circumstances because it was all girls. So we spent mm -hmm. a lot of time like looking at women in like war and all of that. Right. And I, now I'm thinking too that part of the discomfort is like war is overt violence but how do we talk about like that passive violence of um state sanctioned violence yeah like, how do we talk about laws that are perpetuating violence mm -hmm. uh, systems that are i think you're right like, that that's part of what we're not touching on as much as we need to be. Sorry, I'm, I'm going down all these rabbit holes now because I'm trying to remember what we did cover. And now I'm I like, it's, it's clear from people's responses to the show Watchmen about how much ground in general our educational system needs to cover with discussing um, the civil rights movement. Like that so many people were shocked by the Oklahoma um, Yeah, Tulsa. Bombing. Yeah. But my high school actually did cover that because we covered it, I believe, like talking about just war theory, right. which I like where we had a lot of discussions with just war theory about like when is violence um, justified mm -hmm. and, and what sort of violence. And obviously, like that's the case where violence is not justified. <laughs> yeah, but it is like we didn't talk about what happened in Philadelphia. Maybe that's because it's more recent and maybe that's part of this too is how going back to this idea of the history as translation that we prefer the civil rights discussions to be far away from us so and to be centered on peace right mm -hmm. um and that seems to be a blind spot i think i know we haven't we've talked about the children's literature but so far to me this is really driving home the objectives of this sort of course and the need for it. Mm -hmm. That one of the things that literature of the civil rights movement can do is help provide that nuance, that necessary context, but also bring it into the present to not let it be something totally disconnected from the current moment. Because that's something I know like when in my women in literature course, again and again and again students would say like I didn't realize this was still going on because mm -hmm. we would cover a topic and they would start looking it up and they'd be like wait I'm finding articles from like 2017 <laughs> what and it's like, yeah so what are some what are some ways that you would connect it to the current moment I mean that's a that's a good question I think that the our most like obvious answer would be our conversations about police brutality mm -hmm. um, and civil rights are should include the right to exist in certain space like in all spaces not certain spaces but in all spaces um, and we know that there is a potential threat of violence against groups of people based on what spaces they're in and so I think also that civil rights is like civil rights literature is is a way of talking about space. Another way that I would connect it to the to now is to talk about environmental justice. You know, it would need to start with a conversation about how civil rights, the civil rights movement has always been like in tune with environmental justice. But moving forward into the present day, the way we talk about um, urban landscapes, the people there, the issues of segregation that are still relevant and and how people are allocated resources right and even if those resources are just space um to live and be and breathe yeah i think that's like that that's one way that i would talk about it um or bring it to the to the present i'm also kind of rabbit holing here but even just thinking about like urban development and planning right and how that plays out 
in certain spaces and how that's tied to race and economics and how that it literally impacts the way a person is able to live in the world. So you're, you're touching on something that I've been thinking about or not inherently, but thinking about urban space made me think like, Oh, you could start that class with, um, Upton Sinclair's the jungle. Yeah. And then, uh, because what I've been thinking about is part of the reason I think we compartmentalize the civil rights movement is because historically we compartmentalize it. Like it's on AP U.S. history exams, like when did the civil rights movement begin? And it's like, well, you know, it began in the 1600s <laughs> when we began enslaving people and people said no. Um, but that's not the right answer. And so I think if we kind of rethink what civil rights literature is, it can allow us to work with like histories of translation, but also connecting it to the present movement. And I was, I was thinking about ways to do that with the texts we teach. So something like, if you start with Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, your students are gonna be like, that's not the civil rights movement. But as you build off of it to like the subsequent texts, seeing like, oh, okay, like all of these things are connected, intersectionality. But I was also thinking like you could do that, like other ways you could do that is thinking through like the African-American canon with the ways texts respond to one another, like putting the text in conversation, mm -hmm. so seeing how that conversation continues, 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 and the conversation isn't over. Or you could do some more explicit play with it to show how it's a, a global conversation. So if something like with um, Strange Fruit, like that right. it starts as a poem by a white Jewish American man. It's then sung by Billie Holiday, which really puts it on the map. And then you have Irish poets like Seamus Heaney titling poems Strange Fruit to talk about the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. There's a lot actually between Ireland and, and the U.S. in terms of like that sort of cultural exchange. And, and there's also Strange Fruit, the novel by Lillian Smith. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The novel. So you could have like a whole class just on Strange Fruit and the way it, it gets, re not recycled, but puts new lens on it to discuss the nuance yeah. of it. That like when Billie Holiday sings it, she's talking about the black male experience in the South. Like she talked about that in interviews. She was singing it because of her father, like, and, and that sort of threat against black men. But when Lily um, Hellman, right? Oh, Lillian Smith. Lillian Smith. Um, when she writes that, it's much more about like the experiences for Black women as well, right. and and the way that by continuing this, by making it a conversation, we allow a multitude of voices, a multitude of experiences, and I think you get more of those connections. Right. I think you're right. I think that's. I think even thinking about how you could take one sort of concept like strange fruit and that in itself, you can say like, well, isn't that compartmentalizing? But just the way you trace that is to say like, no, even just that one thing is explosive, right? There's yeah. not one version of telling that or one way of working with it. And like that is sort of our goal for approaching civil rights is that we don't, know we know the grand narrative right but this we don't know those stories like mm -hmm. the individual ways that those stories have morphed and changed or can be added to um and how looking at them like with that kind of like i don't know like almost like under a microscope right and really yeah. sort of doing it with the the sense of investigating the grand narrative or the sanitized version or the compartmentalized version really makes it like explosive in interesting ways. I don't know how to contextualize what I'm about to say. Okay. I had texted Paige <laughs> a week or so ago <laughs> that I had been thinking about ways like to teach like trauma, which I think ties into this. I yeah. think the civil rights movement is a movement that responds to cultural trauma. And Paige and I are in a book club where we had read Fortune Smiles and <laughs> that's what I was thinking through that this is a collection of short stories all about how to move towards a more hopeful future after some sort of 
cultural trauma. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about how you could pair those short stories with, with novels to kind of center specific themes that you want to work with. And one of the novels I was thinking about was Imperium and Imperia. I, I might have that title reversed. I think it's by Sutton E. Griggs. Ugh, I want to make sure I get this right because it's a really interesting text. Yes, and yes, um, Okay, perfect. And so I'm going to give some spoilers here. But the reason I was thinking about it is because in Fortune Smiles, there's a story about a, a mother who, a young mother who dies. Um, and she watches her children's life, her husband's life continue after she's gone. And it was making me think about the erasure of mothers and sort of how that works. And in Imperium Imperium, there's a character, I think Violet, who is a mixed race woman who kills herself. And, and she, in her suicide note, says it's for the betterment of the movement. It's so that way the Black race can thrive and she dilutes it. So she can't exist as part of it. Um, because part of the novel is really debating, like, when you fight for Black America, the rights of Black Americans, what does that look like? Like, physically, what does that look like? And um, and it's two primary characters. It's It's sort of anticipates the way we turn the civil rights movement into a binary conversation of Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. it, that binary exists from the very beginning. And it's a text though that's not, I, I didn't come across it until grad school because just like me giving that summary, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like in the summary, I'm putting this out on a podcast. It's kind of like, am I, saying really awful <laughs> things, even though I'm just summarizing a text, because it is a difficult text not to read, but to just talk about and to right. interpret, because it's asking those hard questions of um, how do we define the community that we're fighting for, that when we fight for rights for people, we're fighting for a specific groups. So how do we define the group? What are the right approaches to take? When is violence acceptable? And I think I would teach that though, that novel in an undergrad course. I forget how I got to this point. <laughs> well, we're talking about collective trauma and like yeah. how to move like to a place of hope after the collective trauma. Yeah. And so I feel like what you were saying with the grand narrative is that we have created this very limited understanding of what this collective trauma is, where it's like, oh, the trauma that the civil rights movement responded to was that Black Americans couldn't use the same spaces as white people. And it's like, that's part of it, but that's not it. <laughs> that's the whole of it. And we need to expand that understanding of what the trauma is and how that trauma reverberates today right. and still exists today. Exactly, because that, that version of it, right, that it's about, wholly about, space and laws mm -hmm. regulating space like Jim Crow well we fix that so it's over right yeah so, um, and, that, and that tends to be the mindset of like well we've come so far from that and it's and it's important again to recognize like sure we've come far from that but there are still all of these other intricate sort of parts to this this machine that we still want to talk about and we didn't even mention like we we're thinking about contemporary like how we bring it here we could talk about like the prison industrial complex right and mm -hmm. the way that marijuana is legalized now in states and you still have people sitting like largely minorities sitting in prison for their entire lives that would be an interesting class is like prison literature yeah. Like prison rights, because you could again start with Richard Wright. You could end with an American marriage. Um oh yeah, I forgot about yeah. And like and, um, and that I think that would get into like the nuance that like we have this one understanding by but by adding to this plurality, we don't just understand get a multitude of voices and perspectives, but we also increase our understanding of like what the trauma actually is. Yeah. Now yeah. I want to teach that class. I would also do Sing Unburied Sing by Jasmine mm -hmm. Ward and Colson Whitehead's Nickel Boys. Something else you were you were saying um, 
with the, we fix that problem. So going back to my women in literature class, when we read Price of Salt, which better known as Carol um, by, by Patricia Highsmith, I started that novel with just doing an overview of queer rights in the US. And I th it's always really fascinating to me because I see my students initially coming into that, that class thinking that the gay rights movement like started with the fight for gay marriage. Right. Like overall, obviously there's some students who like know about Stonewall and all of that, mm -hmm. but the majority really see it as gay marriage. So again, it's been boxed in, but we talk about how majority of Americans are now supportive of gay marriage. I forget the exact statistics right now, but I believe it's the majority. And I go, that's an incredibly fast pendulum shift. That's like, it seems like a long time to you because it's been in your lifetime, but that's incredibly fast. In, and to give them that perspective, I say in 1990, the majority of Americans were still against interracial marriage, that it was 49% approved. And like, just thinking about like, again, going back to what you were saying, we fixed the problem, like clearly not when in 1990, the majority are still not okay with the idea of an interracial couple. And like, we have, you know, not extensive discussions, but that like in the movie, what is the movie that Will Smith's in with um, the, the date? I just, I did a dance for people, no one can see it, but he, it's in that one where he's like, teaches guys how to date women. Oh, um, ah, yeah. I like that one. Hitch. Hitch. Yes. I knew it was like wedding. <laughs> in my head, it's like getting hitched, but hitch. That they had to recast the female lead in that once they cast Will Smith because they had cast a white actress. I did not know that. Yeah, they recast it because they felt that Americans wouldn't see the movie. And like, how interesting would it be to compile like a list of instances like that? Yeah. Um, for that really sort of like moment of like to combat that that idea of like the work is done it's we fixed it to and to see that i feel like like i didn't know that i find that really shocking i don't know why right but yeah. um and that that's movies made in 2004 yeah right I'm, I'm saying that very confidently just for anyone listening to this i'll look um, it up i'll fact check <laughs> you right now 2005, yeah. so you were very close. I don't know what it says about me that that fact lives in my brain. Like, <laughs> I've seen Hitch like twice. It's not like it's my favorite movie that I'm sure, pulling. Sure, Margaret. Sure. <laughs> yeah, now it all comes out that like I'm just a huge fan of Hitch. We can segue into like the films that we would teach if we taught. Like, you know, I always go into film. I'm like, yes. But you mentioned, you also mentioned Watchmen, which I hadn't thought about. I don't know why, but even like Watchmen, what's the, I haven't watched it yet. Lovecraft Country mm. might be interesting. And like Selma, the I'm Not Your Negro Baldwin documentary, stuff like that. There's a lot with those. So I, I rabbit hole a little, but. No, but it also brings up, because thinking about how to expand, you could also include movies or, and, and texts like smoke signals mm -hmm. and thinking about like the American Indian movement. I was also thinking, um, in my postmodern class in, when I was an undergrad, we read autobiography of a Brown Buffalo mm -hmm. by, um, Acosta, uh, Oscar Zeta Acosta, um, who he is better known as the Samoan in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which he is not Samoan, <laughs> he's Mexican-American, um, but Hunter S. Thompson decided he was Samoan, so, you know, and, and even, like, you could do pairings like that, like, have your students read Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and um, Autobiography of a Brown Buffalo to talk about those, the representations, like, white representations of these movements because Acosta ends up like trying to join up with the Chicano movement in California. And that's where hit that um, 
memoir ends. But that memoir does really interesting things with race. Have you read it? No. So like, and that, like, as you're saying these things, I'm like, wow, I, my own personal sort of blind spots are really like, when I think about civil rights, and I'm working in civil rights, I'm thinking specifically the South, right? But like, all these things that you're bringing up are kind of even just like a further, like, I keep saying the word explosion, but like, it, it sort of explodes this idea of the civil rights as just being like, it's just tied to the South. It's just tied to Jim Crow. That's the only way we look at it. And there's a lot of potential and a lot of necessity for these other versions of co- like these other conversations about the civil rights. Yeah, I, I know. I forget who created it, but thinking about digital humanities, there's a map. Um, I, I don't know how interactive it is, but of lynchings in America and like yeah. who the person was. And one of the goals was also to show like how in, there was lynchings in the Southwest and in the West, but they were largely of Mexican American men, but like that narrative. But um, well, when you were talking- all, I just want to say that's lynching in America is that map. Mm-hmm. And if you Google that, it'll, it'll be the first one that comes up. But you also said about, the how it's limited to the south and as someone who grew up in the north i think that's also a real blind spot in general because the north loves to like let themselves off the hook of like we you know those southerners are so racist and that's something else would be really interesting with richard wright um that native son like his editor his publishers made him I forget if it was like end the book earlier or what, but part of his original manuscript was going up north to Detroit and realizing it was just as racist. It's just racist in a different way. And the publishers were like, no, like it has to end like kind of on a triumphant moment. And so it kind of gives that sense of like, he leaves the South and escapes racism, but he's like, no. Oh, I'm out of North and you were just as racist. Wait, and wait that was that Native Son? What happened? I think it's Native Son. Um, I have Native Son ends with like bigger and the trial, right? No, I'm not thinking of Native Son. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of. Are you thinking of Black Boy? Black Boy. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking of Black Boy. Yes, because Native Son's in set in Chicago. Yeah, and it's it's fiction. Native Son. This is his biography. And so it's like split up. I think it ends up being split up into two, but the publication history for Black Boy is interesting because it is just like, uh, I might be, I hope I'm not totally misrepresenting it. And maybe he fought for it to be added, but that would be actually interesting, an interesting class too. Thinking of about like, how, like publications, right? Yeah, and going into that sort of like censorship or, or like right. the narrative building with, not just writers, but who's publishing it. Yep. And like, who's been allowed to tell their story and how has it been altered or forced to be altered or censored to fit into a more amenable version? It would also be interesting with that to look at the publishing houses who were publishing these stories in terms of like, not just from like, to give it more positive spin than just like, these are how they were censoring, but also like these were who were, who was giving a platform. Because that was something, I'm bringing up my postmodern class now twice, but we didn't have papers for that class. We always just had quizzes and exams, which was the only literature class I've ever had that was like that. But this, this professor, he, his approach was cultural capital, that all of these things are connected. And obviously it has really shaped my approach because he sold it to me. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's so true. And our quizzes for every novel would always ask like, who was the publishing house for this book? Name two other novels they've published. And he was trying to show us that there was like certain publishing houses that were making specific efforts to publish these things that were considered unpublishable. So like they were the ones constantly getting charged with like obscenity, pornography, Mm -hmm. all that stuff. But really it was like they were publishing queer texts and then being charged with obscenity. Uh. So you have like, these publishing houses whose part of their unspoken mission is like publishing 
queer voices or black voices, et cetera. And sometimes they are explicit missions, but sometimes it's, you have to go and look like what's their list to, to piece that out. And I think that would be important for students to, cause I think sometimes with this sort of literature, we accidentally create a myth of this solitary genius, this solitary activist. It's the writer alone working in his or her, her apartment to take down the system alone. And our students then think like, great for them, but I'm not talented enough to do that. I'm not perfect enough to do that. And we have to put it back in the network. And like these people were working with larger systems to do this. You can be a part of a system. It's not, you don't have to take that mantle on your shoulders alone. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Margaret, what other things do you think we haven't talked about that would be important to cover? Well, I think we haven't talked about the tenuous connection between the suffragette movement and the civil rights movement early on. Not civil rights, uh, abolition is yeah. the movement. But, sure. And, you know, there's pros or cons and cons to that connection. I think we haven't talked about it because we have a whole episode on suffragette mm -hmm. literature and the mm -hmm. way it empowered and disempowered voices. Well, and, and so, like, thinking, too, like, how there even now there are these conversations when we make progress in one sort of area of civil rights where another is there's another area that's like but like I'm thinking about Gina Rodriguez mm. and how when Black Panther came out she said those things of like well where's our Latino Latina Panther or superhero or whatever and it um and in a way that's like not that's an important question but the way she did it was you don't deserve this. We do. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, I think that connects to the, to what you're saying about like women's rights and the way in movements that are overlaid, the journey for equality for women has often like overlooked the queer voices, black voices, women of color. And you can kind of see like that happen. And you could even talk about that um, within the civil rights movement when we talk about uh, key civil rights activists mm -hmm. that are men. Um, and we, we don't talk as much about the women who are just as important to, you know, the reversal or of Jim Crow, right? Yeah. Or even thinking about the men who get overlooked because they don't fit the right boxes, like Bayard Rustin. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any sort of fictional depictions of him. I know there's a documentary, but I'm also thinking have this be an assignment because I know I've done a similar assignment with my students where they had a like low stakes writing assignment after reading um, Herland. Mm -hmm. And we had the discussion about, this is a feminist utopia, but it's a feminist utopia that excludes women of color, queer women, disabled women, like, et cetera. It's a very specific understanding of uh, womanhood. And so we talked about what do we do with this text? Should this be considered part of the feminist canon? And we had, the, they wrote this low stakes writing assignment so that way they'd be prepared with their thoughts to have this class discussion. And we talked about like how they, they came to the conclusion that it, it should be considered part of the feminist canon but you have to acknowledge its failings because if we exclude it from the feminist canon, if we cancel Charlotte Perkins Gilman, we lose the conversation about the way the feminist movement has historically marginalized women and how that continues to have an effect today. Like if we just ignore it, we can't address it. So we have to include it so we can have that connection to the present moment and address what it's doing today. Right. And very proud of my students <laughs> in that conversation. <laughs> but I think you could do a similar assignment with like a liter class on literature of civil rights. And maybe like, that's like a project you have towards the end of like, what does your civil rights canon look like? Right. Yeah. And I was just thinking too about, we haven't touched on, and I didn't do any research on it. So I don't have anything super great to say, but like even civil rights and disability studies could also be a class in this sort of category. Yeah, do something with the ADA in my composition classes for us to think about the accessibility of the text we create. But I haven't thought about it from a literature perspective. But I will say again, the students are always really surprised by how recent the ADA was mm -hmm. and what life was like for 
Americans with disabilities before its passing and yeah. the holes that are still left. Um, so yeah, thinking again about that intersectionality of that would be really interesting. And I think really engage students. Like, yeah. I think students are really hungry for texts like this and, and not just students who want to be English majors. Like, I think you can totally do this with an intro class and have mm -hmm. students really active and excited about the material. Yeah, definitely. I think so too. I'm excited about the material. Yeah. So, so with that, what, what is your dream course today? I feel like such a cop out when I'm always like, well, it's actually what we're talking about. But I really think that thinking about like civil rights and prisons and plantations and the environment would be really interesting. And so my goal for that class, I'm trying to start with my goal and not the text I would use. But my goal would sort of be to think through the web of connections between those three, right? So environment, prison, plantation. So thinking about people uh, and being confined and the way that we've used these spaces as to hide things mm -hmm. um, and also as like human laboratories and the connection to labor. I would talk about uh, the, the, the text we already mentioned, right? I think I would do Richard Wright's Native Son, even though that's like the bigger does go to jail in that, but it's like the, the trial and everything. Yeah. And then the, the sort of loss of agency. But then I would Colson Whitehead's Nickel Boys, which was really, really a great book, Sing Unburied Sing, which talks about like collective trauma over generations. Sorry about my dogs, ignore them. And American Marriage. So, and then I would also think, I'd have to decide like what kind of plantation literature I would Did include. Would you love it? think that Beloved would be a really good text for this class. The way, the way that I'm imagining it in my head. Yeah. Um, Cause I was just thinking about like, it's not the way it's normally positioned, obviously, but what you were saying with that web, I'm like, Beloved is that web. Like you have yeah. the tree, you have the chain gang, you, like yeah, the dirt yeah. that actually covers them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I would want to talk about how like physical landscapes can be, like in prison people, especially on plantations. And I think Setha having to run while pregnant and then birthing her child on the run is a really good example. So what's your dream course though? Well, I'd already mentioned it. Like I, I'm really thinking a lot about that like class on trauma because I would want really to position it as a class on like literature on how we build a future post-trauma that mm -hmm. I feel a lot of times when we read books about trauma in these classes it's just about the trauma itself and it becomes a little bit like um voyeuristic sure yeah um, of like look how awful this is isn't the world terrible look at how this person has suffered um so really thinking through like how one of the purposes of this sort of literature is to move, not move past it and forget it, but how do we rebuild? And Fortune Smiles has really made me think about this. And I would like to pair it with, as I said, with different novels. And so, um, like, I talk about it all the time, but Corrigadora. Like, it's <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Like, I knew that was coming I know. Out next. <laughs> because the students do initially focus on just, like, how traumatic it is. Mm -hmm. I'm like, is it a novel? about that trauma it's a novel about art and how you have people creating new ways of living and and maybe it's not the ways that they foresaw for themselves but they're not like it's it's how do we move past where this trauma has shaped us but how do we not let it define us mm -hmm. and i think that's a really important question of how do we acknowledge that trauma has formed who we are culturally, like both as individuals and as a culture, but how do we not let it be the defining aspect? Right. Um, but you could also like do it with, um, I was trying to think of what the other novels I was thinking of, um, cause I wanted some fun novels. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I'm blanking on them that I, I had been thinking about this so much and it's all blanking, but yeah, but having it paired with the short stories, because I was thinking of um, 
starting with there's a story in it called um, George Orwell was a friend of mine, which is all about a yes. prison guard for, for a East Germany prisoner um, who's, you know, living in the current moment. And Paige has read this, so she knows it all. But um, he he lives near the prison still, which has been turned into a museum that people come to to learn about this history. And he doesn't understand it. And I'd like that to be the, the start of the class because that story is all about the tension between competing narratives. And they keep talking about that. Like, oh, they're just selling this story. It's emotional, so people are buying it. Um, and that like, he really truly seems to think that this narrative of trauma is just something that's profitable. And, and it's not true. And his, his narrative is the true one. And so what happens when these narratives come into conflict? And that's what I'd wanna talk about with my students of, the tensions we see in the present moment today in, in our politics, in our culture, it is the conflict between narratives. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, and so these, these stories, these narratives of, tr of trauma, how do we, how do we negotiate them? How do we and, negotiate them? I like that. Yeah. Also, this is all from Henry Louis Gates, Stony the Road, which is a nonfiction, <laughs> but he, he says that, the North won the Civil War, but the South won the narrative. Yeah. And, and, and so, well, then how do we create new narratives? And that's why Corregidora would be included in the class, because that's that same question. How do we create a new narrative? Yeah, Margaret, that sounds so interesting. That would have to be an upper level course, not right. an intro course. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, but, uh, Classes about trauma or about civil rights don't have to be upper level. Not just right. one. Definitely. Yeah. Um, well, okay. this is exciting to yeah. record again. <laughs> it really was. I enjoyed it. No, I don't know how to wrap up because no, I just want to talk and talk and talk, but we cannot talk for forever. I mean, we probably could, but, <laughs> you know. No one wants us to. Yeah, so I'll say. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>